Okay, I think everybody's here. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, a little disclaimer to our audience today. Uh, I think a few of us are experiencing power cuts, so please bear with us. Um, do let us know if there's any audio, uh, audio issues and we'll try our best to, to figure something out. Um, but yes, today's discussion is a little bit of a topical one and I'm very excited to have you all here with us today. Um, so let me just get straight into it. Um, so Umesh, uh, Chai, you, Rehana, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, Rehana, this is I think your third time uh, joining yeah. us. It's always a pleasure. Chai, you, Umesh, uh, welcome. Uh, and I'm very excited for today's conversation. Okay, I think the audio sounds good. So thank you, thank you for that. Uh, so yeah, so let's begin. So what's happening, right? So we're seeing so many, uh, we're seeing so many fuel lines outside. We're seeing gas shortages. We feel we're seeing milk powder shortages. We're seeing medicinal shortages, um, and it's it's scary conversations happening uh, throughout. And when you're looking at social media, you're seeing very very serious uh, conversations happening. And we at Advocata, we've spoken a lot about this previously in 2020. We highlighted a lot of the issues. We started talking about it last time. And we, we were talking about how maybe it was a debt crisis initially. First, it was a balance of payment crisis. Now we're seeing all these people on the roads and we have, I think everyone shouting that it's a political crisis. But I think what I want to highlight most in today's discussion is that the underlying issues that we're facing is that it's been an economic crisis all around. It's been bad economic policies that have kind of got us here. And I think it's going to be proper economic uh, policies that will try and help us get out of it. Um, so thank you, three, for coming up on board and allowing us to talk about it. Um, so to start off, um, so I think at the moment, I'm of the kind of opinion that stabilization is of paramount importance. Um, and we can look into the long-term trajectory of the economy. We need to get back on track for the moment, I, is, is, is what I'm thinking. And this is a lot of, this is also like a lot of questions that we're getting around. Like, what do we do to kind of get ourselves out of this rut at the moment? And if I could just pass on the mic to try you to kind of answer this first and then we'll go around the board. Um, so what do you, what do you all think that are the first three, uh, first few initial steps that we need to take to kind of get the economy back on track to get it back on its feet. Okay. Uh, thanks. And you know, thanks for having us here today as well. Uh, I think one of the most critical things that the economy is facing right now in terms of the actual uh, you know, problem is things stemming from the forex shortage. That's what's causing power cuts to get worse. That's what's causing food shortages to get worse. So the absolute critical urgent thing is to deal with that or at least reduce the impact of that so that power cuts become, become lower, so that we have you know, great access to gas, there's greater access uh, to food, medicines in short supply and the like. So for that, one key thing that has to happen as a big signaling step would be raising interest rates pretty significantly. Ideal. I think there's some sense from the recent Treasury bill auctions that there is an indication of a very sharp rate hike coming. So if that really coming through uh, would be a good and critical first step to really signal we are now that the central bank with the new governor coming in is really serious about taking big steps. Uh, then moving forward with the IMF negotiations, really properly starting that without being a little wishy-washy on the process, properly starting that and also really accelerating steps on the debt uh, negotiation restructuring process. My personal view is that a suspension and collecting areas and then moving on to the process is better because of the payments we are having due even in, over the next uh, week or two. But something that immediately starts the process and just signals locally and internationally that Sri Lanka is finally getting its act together, taking serious steps. Uh, and hopefully that combination of factors will, and of course, I think there are some other monetary foreign exchange factors that such as removing some of these uh, forex surrender requirements from the bank system to allow a little bit more space to open up there. But I, I hope that the combination of those factors should be enough, along with the support provided by our bilateral partners, which should also I can increase as a result of us taking these steps to you know, improve the forex uh, urgency, emergency on the ground. And then we can also then move on to the more, I guess, short to medium term as actions such as no budgetary reform and the like. Thank you, Chayu. Thank you for that. Um, Rihanna, would you like to comment on anything before we? Yeah, sure. Um, I mean, I, I, you know, the situation we are seeing right now with people 
you know protesting day in and day out they are basically they are demanding solutions right so it's big, big the situation has become aggravated now because the government has failed to address the economic crisis the economic issues um you know like until a couple of weeks ago before the protest started maybe it makes sense to talk about like you know what are the reforms that you should be doing but now it has come to a situation as you rightly said where we have to stabilize our economy because it is you know like it's spiraling out of control now um so i i, I agree with chayu when he says that um we need to increase policy rates because that uh, you know is going to help us um you know curb infl- inflationary and devaluation pressures so i think the issue so far has been that um, like if you if you take um, you know the forex uh, uh, the fixed exchange rate or rather managed float exchange rate that was followed um, you know we saw that it was a good signal when they decided to float it but then it wasn't sequenced with policy rate hikes so then now you're seeing uh, you know the rupee uh, you know shoot overshooting um so i think there is a sequence of policy decisions that has to be made and i think we it it's it, it is very confidence inspiring that uh, now we have um, a central bank governor who is more you know orthodox economics um so i think it 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 puts us in in a in a better position than i would say maybe a couple of days ago uh, you know in rather than where we were a couple of days ago So yes I think uh, policy rates and I I think appointing the a good governor was also one of the uh, better decisions that was made and then policy rates and then obviously um ramping up the IMF negotiations really you know coming out and telling the public this is you know this is what we have uh, you know told the IMF this is uh, you know this is when the discussions are going to start these are what are you know what we are going to be discussing so it's all important it's all about building confidence now Yeah and I think I completely agree with the it's all about building credibility and building confidence. Um Umesh I'm sorry I think we lost you there. Um if yes, what we yes, can we can can you uh, no I yes I I I could hear here and there. Um it's ironic that it's, uh, it's hard to talk about the economy in in this economy. Uh, but anyway um <laughs> So as as Rehana pointed out and Chai also said that this it may sound like repetition but it's important to emphasize that we need to think about and going for debt negotiations immediately because still the government hasn't released a proper statement saying that look here we can't pay debt and we will restructure you have to come up with a very clear uh, statement preferably from the president uh saying that we are going to uh, negotiate debt and this is how we are going to do uh, the previous statements came from the presidents were like you know more like going round and round bluffing we may go to im maybe if they agree with us and if they agree with our policy stances blah 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 i mean this kind of thing doesn't really work because this is not a domestic issue that's what we really need to understand i think a lot of people don't get the magnitude of the problem we are at a point where we won't actually be able to import food or fuel for future years so next month if we don't resolve these problems within one month or two uh, we might not have electricity maybe like for days i mean uh, it's it's the reality when when these things were told a couple of months ago nobody really believed that but when the 13 power cut hits then everybody was like oh wow something's happening so i think it's time that people also think that this is an unprecedented crisis still that message hasn't really been communicated even during the protest i've been to few and what i've noticed is they think that simply rajapaksha's looted money and rajapaksha's bringing some amount of looted money would resolve the crisis sorry that's not going to happen so you you need we need to immediately go for the imf uh issue a letter of intent i don't know whether the letter of intent was issued or not because even that part wasn't clear so these are the things that you really need clarity with like we are like people who actually study this crisis constantly and there are a lot of people who are on the the you know talk about it and uh, analyze this and still even those people don't know whether a letter of intent was issued by sri lanka to the imf talking about uh, debt negotiations right so that means like nobody really knows and that is exactly what you don't need in a situation like this because as Rehana pointed out what you really need at this point is confidence and the other thing is clarity. If you take a look at how uh, Dr. Kumar Swami handled some of the matters during 2016 to 2019, uh, 
it, uh, he acknowledged that the economy was vulnerable, but he provided clarity during every monetary policy briefing, saying that this is the situation we are in. These are the options we're going to take. Not like blank statements saying, okay, we get a 500 million from here. We might get a 1 billion from China. We might get a credit line from Oman, which, you know, none of these things materialize. Or like a fake roadmap that says here, we're going to uh, build up reserves like this. So the clarity is important. I hope that the new governor will establish us that. And it, this also requires a political uh, commitment. Sadly, though, the the people have made this into a political crisis now i think this this uh, so now on top of an economic crisis we have to resolve political issues also but we can't wait till political issues is solved to resolve the economic issues because that is the more, most immediate concern so uh, go to imf i think we already talked about interest rate hikes and etc but uh, expedite the imf process and the debt restructuring process yeah Thank you. Thank you so much, Umesh. And I think I, I, I completely agree with um, what you were saying um, regarding going to the IMF, uh, because I think everyone agrees uh, or that this doesn't see any other uh, viable solution um, at the moment. Um, my question to you, and, and this could all the questions that we've been getting, is also, I, you touched upon this earlier, but if I could just like ask you, uh, Rehana and Chai, again, in the event that we don't go into the IMF um, as as quickly as we would like, like how do you see this playing out? This situation. Right. Uh, if Should we I don't go, go to, uh, you want me to go first? Yeah, you can go. Okay. Um, if we uh, if we don't go to IMF, I think we our reserves, our usable reserves, are below five hundred uh, million. Uh, dollars and that's a really low and um, we can't really use all of these reserves and we import a lot of stuff for every month and we don't have enough money to import and that is why the fuel chips and the gas chips are sitting uh, near the dock without uh, having the ability to unload so this could get worse so to to put it very simply we might not have gas uh, we might not have electricity you may think about a situation the 13 power card fuel shortages this could get worse Right. I mean, we, people think that this is the worst case, but it is not. If you do not pay debt, it could go, get worse. And maybe for days, we might not have electricity, fuel, etc. Uh, and uh, the other part is we won't be able to repay our loans. Uh, and if we don't start renegotiating debt restructuring and so on and so forth, that means we will... Uh, we will just default, you know, so something what we call uh, unceremonious default uh, scenario. Uh, just, you know, just decide all of a sudden, okay, we can't pay you guys and there's nothing we can do, you know. That's a really bad, uh, bad way to go about it. And what it will do is it will tarnish the credibility of Sri Lanka, uh, not only Sri Lanka, but also Sri Lanka's financial system. And that will, that is likely to result in most countries banks not accepting letter of credit issued by sri lanka but and what it means is we will have a severe problem in terms of importing literally everything because we we really don't control international finance uh, it is it is really depending on how much of clarity confident and uh, uh, other pro procedures that we have domestically in place and how much of faith that the international financial system has on sri lanka so once you lose it we, you won't be able to import and that means, uh, uh, I don't know, it, it means the next level of chaos because if you, the 50%, 60% of our raw materials are imported, most of our food items are imported, poor electricity imported. And uh, so unless, you know, India, China agrees to continue to give us fuel and food, uh, we might start to, start to, <laughs> we might start to uh, death, I would say, if we continue to do that, because uh, some some may think that I am uh, you know exaggerating this, but I think at this point it's important to tell how bad things can get. So yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, I think uh, you know, Nakia, your question was what will happen if we don't go to IMF, right? I mean, we are already living it, right? We we are having power cuts. We are have we don't have gas. We don't have certain food items. There's no milk powder because there's no money to import. So we are already living, uh, you know, the, the impacts of not going to IMF any sooner. And now that we have like come to such a critical situation, now we have decided to go to the IMF. So obviously it will get worse if we don't follow, you know, 
the path that has been laid out for us um and as uh, you know umesh said it's going if if we go into a default status that's going to completely jeopardize you know not just the government it's going to completely jeopardize even our private businesses i mean already they are like those days they used to be able to get one years letters of credit but now they can't get you know uh supply to them because they don't want to take the risk and then if you take shipping premium shipping premiums are going up so these are all you know it's going to make life a lot a lot lot harder than it already is so you know it's not even something that we should be uh, entertaining i'll just add like one example just to give a sense of right now where the situation is um i think a few days ago it was that we couldn't clear a, a payment for about 5 million dollars for uh i think a last gas uh shipment now i mean yes 5 million dollars sounds like a lot but in the context of a country that's an extremely extremely small amount that's as if like someone couldn't pay 100 rupees and they you know had to starve i mean yes that happens but hap that happens only to those who are in, in extreme level of poverty so that's essentially the kind of forex reserves and the forex situation that the country is going through um if we can get through it i mean i'm seeing a lot of more uh, i guess pessimistic comments uh, but you know it, there are ways through it and i think we'll talk through that but uh, you know that is the situation that we're in and we need to recognize that it's extremely critical already and it will only get worse uh, as we go on thank you so much i think yeah like everybody mentioned i think it's important to understand the bit of truth that it's it's difficult and it will only get difficult if we don't kind of do the hard things that we do need to do and that brings us to the whole question of imf I think there's a lot of like questions about this, a lot of confusion because we hear people saying that we've been to the IMF now 16 times. If we do go to the IMF now, which we should, um, it'll be the 17th time. But I think the key difference that we need to highlight is the fact that all those 16 times we were never going to the IMF to restructure our debt. Uh, we were never going on the brink of this this default, uh, and I think that's the key to highlight. And I think Chai, you when you were talking, uh, you highlighted the whole. whether we suspend debt do we go how does the negotiation with the creditors work um um that kind of the confusion that people have um would you be able to kind of give us a, a highlight a little bit more and clarify those doubts of the process yeah i think one thing especially on the debt side of things uh, and i'll start there is that compared to lots of other things the idea of default there is no clear specific definition of exactly what constitutes what so you know you know we throw it out these terms default we talk about selective default or you know partial default disorderly orderly none of these are clearly defined terms so different circumstances in different countries can lead to any of those kinds of overall situations so i think something that uh, both umesh and rehana said earlier comes very importantly is that it's not only the level of debt and the problems that you're facing with but also how much confidence that you are providing to your external parties on what the process forward is the less confidence that you can provide the less clarity uh, that you can provide then the more disorderly the worse the outcomes can get so i'll just give a quick example of a few countries uh, suriname and zambia for example uh, over the last few years uh, last few years you know had these debt issues these countries actually suspend like you know they were talking to creditors and all but at some point when they couldn't get this consent solicitate that is agree to pause payments with their creditors before starting the debt restructuring negotiation uh you know sometimes that didn't doesn't didn't work out for these countries so they instead suspended payments uh you know collected arrears and in the meantime started talking and beginning that consent solicitation process now that doesn't necessarily mean it's a disorderly default as long as you do it properly now if you had just suspended payments and then been like essentially doing a sri lanka is you know maybe we'll appoint an advisor maybe we'll talk to our creditors we don't really know what to do that's terrible but if you suspend payments and do essentially what sudan and zambia did that is you clearly lay out we are doing it for this purpose we are starting our pro this process you continue to negotiate and engage with this process that's not necessarily so negative and you can see that in those countries example as well they both of them fell into what's called a selective default uh, in terms of rating category and you know they didn't have any issues with meeting uh, you know imports or things like that you know you could still do that that trade system didn't like collapse like there's a kind of a sense that that might happen that's not necessarily true it's just that you need to inspire confidence and provide clarity on the pathway forward and as long as you can do that uh there is a pathway out of it i saw even today there was a some sort of statement from some uh, london 
a group of investors that say that had themselves asked for Sri Lanka to immediately begin, uh, you know, putting like a moratorium on our international debt because they too recognize that you know it's critical that we start getting on this pathway, uh, lest we end up in a situation where we just you know stop paying and we still you know kind of finding our way, not sure what to do. So I, I'm just I, I recognize that you know this debt situation it's very complicated. There's no clear answer to it, uh, but I think the best way that I can explain it is that. You know, we are in a lot of problems. That's, I think, clear to everyone. But what you need is confidence uh, that you need to inspire and that confidence can easily come through you know, proper, clear communication on what you're doing, why you're doing it, and you know, the specific steps that you're going to take moving forward. And then you have to follow up on those steps as well. Thank you. Thank you, Chayu. Um, I'm wondering, Umesh, would you like to add anything, Rehana? Um, yeah, I just want to say, I think there is a fear that there are no solutions, right? Because, uh, you know, some people don't understand what, you know, what is, what is debt and what is defaulting and what, you know, what are the, what are the implications of it? And there's a fear that there are no solutions. So I just want to reassure people that, you know, there are solutions. It's just a matter of actually, uh, you know, taking the step. Um, and implementing those solutions and taking, you know, the effort to actually um, do what has to be done. Um, and, you know, uh, you know, as Chayu said, you know, even, even the bondholders are, you know, at the end of the day, bondholders, they want to get paid, right? So they also, they also don't want us to default, right? Because the only, they don't really have any, uh, you know, any legal claims over, say, you know, unlike, say, if I, if I, you know, it's not like I, I mortgaged a house and took a loan. Then if I default on the loan, the bank can come and take, uh, you know, my house away. But that's not the case when it comes to bonds. They don't have a legal, uh, you know, claim over a part of, you know, Sri Lanka or, you know, some kind of national asset. So they also want us to pay, right? And they understand. And I think in January, when we decided to pay the 500 million bond, uh, there was an investment house. Um, I can't remember his name, but he had said, you know, I'm surprised that they're paying it. I, I don't know why they're in such a bad situation. I don't know why they're paying it, right? So they understand the situation. They know that we have to go uh, for a debt restructuring program. And debt restructuring is not, uh, it's new to us. It's new to Sri Lanka, but it has happened like, I don't know, some 600 odd times in the last, um, you know, 70 odd years, I think IMF has helped. Um, and then, so it's not, it's not something new. It, it has happened. Uh, you know, uh, there are uh, many examples of countries that have recovered from it. Um, you know, the solutions are there. We have, you know, best practices. We have international case studies. There are lots of experts. There are so many experts in Sri Lanka. There are so many international experts. So I think it's important to, you know, uh, maintain that uh, confidence that we can get out of this situation. Thank you, Rana. Uh, Umesh, are you? Can you um, hear us? I think most most things that uh, yeah, I can hear. Uh, the most things that needed to be said, uh, Chayu and uh, Rehana said. I think I I would uh, like people to pay more attention to the examples that Chayu gave, Suriname and Zambia. I think also the the point about confidence and parity. Uh, we can save ourselves from the crisis by laying out a clear plan it's very it's a simple solution actually just telling the global community the investors everyone okay this is what we are going to do yes we are in a crisis now this is what we are going to do but that is what exactly lacking to a point where we don't have a finance minister or a finance minister secretary right now so these are the kind of things that tarnishes the uh, confidence of international investor because it gives the signal that uh, you know they are they are they are still not figuring this out a way of the way out of the crisis. So one good thing was to okay the appointment of the governor because uh, he had a lot of experience under him and uh, that sort of provide a lot of clarity in terms of what he's going to do and also the advisory committee because that has a lot of people with international experience. So so those I would take as two positive steps, but uh, take the other steps uh, too. Yeah. Yeah, and uh, I just like to add, uh, you know, when we are in Sri Lanka, so we get the information from a variety of, you know, outlets. We are looking at Twitter, we are looking at the, the news, we are, you know, talking to each other, we are getting, you know, WhatsApp forwards and memes, and you know, we have a bigger understanding of the situation. But 
if you take somebody uh, you know an international uh, bond holder or an investor they are getting news from you know mainly international you know news outlets and obviously they are whatever their connections are here so they you know we need to send the signal to them and there there's a process that has to be done you they have the the government as we said the government has to come out and you know be very clear about you know x by z they have to be very clear about what their uh, path and objectives are right thank you thank you and i i completely agree i feel like at this point uh, going to the imf it's a kind of signal to all our creditors that we're trying to be uh, it's a credibility signal essentially and that is exactly what we're lacking now and that's very uh, that's a kind of important step that we need to take um and regarding imf i feel like we've got a lot of questions um and to talk about the debt restructuring itself um would you be able to share some light on what would you ex- think that an ideal restructuring program would look like in sense that how would in terms of what would you how would creditors essentially take their haircuts what would the interest rate kind of changes look like uh, i know chai you mentioned that it, it depends on country to country it depends on creditors to creditors and it's a complicated process but um, i think that's kind of where uh, people are kind of asking for just just to kind of get some clarity on what to expect Okay, so I'll answer it like this. So I, um, what's most likely and almost uh, you know inevitable to be included in the restructuring of ours is our international sovereign bonds. Uh, that's the primary thing that's going to uh, going to be included and going to be talked about. Um, for those, I think we've seen examples like Ecuador, where they've been on the more positive side of things, right? Where they've gotten a haircut close to about a little less than ten percent. uh and you know this is a country that has engaged with creditors before they know what they're doing they move fast and their situation was actually broadly a lot more credible than ours so realistically expecting that level of haircut for sri lanka seems a little bit uh i would say over optimistic so sri lanka's haircuts are probably closer to you know maybe even closer to the kind of recovery values that you're seeing in bonds right now you know bonds are trading at 50 60 cents depending on which bond you're talking about so you know that level of haircut is possible uh, but one key thing there is to also figure out what the government wants to do and whether the government wants to actually go ahead that kind of haircut because there is yes some amount of that bond uh, held by the local banking system as well so that's also part of that discussion right like would you rather prefer to have a bigger maturity extension or push the uh, bonds forward into the future a little bit more and try to get the bond holders to agree to that instead of taking a haircut because of what that means for the local banking system would creditors also want a uh, more local currency debt to be included broadly it seems unlikely because of the impact of inflation kind of in, in effect having a bit of a haircut uh, or reducing the impact of the local currency debt but you know will for example these uh, sri lanka development bonds be included which is a dollar bond but in, uh, released under issued under local law is that something is going to be included how will that affect the system because that's also under uh, the banking system but i think broadly the expectation and i've seen this in some uh, international reports as well is that it's probably likely that we'll see a relatively i would see even a relatively steep haircut uh, you know not the 10% kind of numbers bigger than that but not these eights you know not a 70 80 90% number either so somewhere in between what that number would look like of course again very much depends on what else gets included in the debt restructuring and what the government themselves also are willing to compromise on whether there are other actions that have been taken for example there are very sharp interest rate hikes you know you know doubling tripling tripling of interest rates those are things that can also tie into this debt restructuring talk and reduce the need for you know more drastic measures on that end so it's a combination of all uh, those kinds of things so yes i mean it is difficult for me to give a straight answer there but I, what i can say is that it's unlikely to be you know the 10% kind of low levels of haircuts also unlikely to be the you know 80 90% extremely high levels of haircuts Right. Thank you so much, Charlie. Um, Rihanna, Amish, if you would like to uh, comment on anything, or should I just continue? Uh, Rihanna, I don't. I can't hear you. Yeah, sorry, I muted myself. Um, I think someone had asked what the haircut is, so I think we'll just go through that process. So when you're talking about a debt restructuring, there are um, there are d- different types, uh, you know, of ways of doing it. so one is you uh, a haircut is technically where you uh, negotiate with the bond holders to uh, reduce the the principal or the interest payment or both right 
so it, it, eventually the let's say 1 billion dollars and you know they agree to a 20% uh, haircut then your principal becomes 800 million dollars so that is technically what a haircut is um and the other other type of debt restructuring is uh, deferring the maturity uh, so let's say now we have a bond maturing in uh, july and if if we decide if if we if we are you know if we are quick enough to do it let's say they, they decide to postpone it by let's say 2 years or something like that so then that would that is also restructuring where you push the the due date ahead thank you and um and i think another question that we are getting uh mesh we could just address that to you is this question like you mentioned about disorderly orderly debt that we in and are we in for disorderly debt if so what are the implications of it um um i think i mentioned about this before as well that uh, disorderly that that could actually uh a uh, little bit here okay okay um so the la- yeah okay um uh, i think i explained the disorder default before as well um the implications of of it could be the worst implication could be um we having serious difficulties to import uh, but see then again this really as tai you mentioned this really depends on how we go about it the way we default and then the kind of signals that we give to the creditor saying okay uh we are defaulting now and then we are going to imf we are going to figure this out this is our plan that kind of a thing the worst case scenario would be the if the government doesn't really care about anything at all and just default uh, uh, you know i really hope that it wouldn't happen um in in such cases uh, you will you will face a situation where you will struggle to import um, literally everything because there would be a problem to issue letter of credits and other countries banks uh, accepting um, those okay yeah. thank you mesh um, and also another question i think that uh, we've been getting is in regard to actually going into an ia program and that kind of concern that people are having in the sense that there'll be welfare cuts essentially and these kinds of fiscal consolidation measures that will affect the people more negatively than 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 ideal is that that's the kind of concern that i think people are having when when the word imf is mentioned in any kind of context i'm wondering if you could clear some of that doubt for people um i'll i'll add a bit um, because i might actually lose power as in uh, i might my battery might die you in a bit so uh, so uh, um when when we say imf uh, there are two words that people usually associate imf with one is austerity measures and that somehow those austerity measures people equalize those austerity measures to cut off healthcare free healthcare free education and social welfare uh, this is sort of a myth and a sort of a misconception i'm not saying that the imf does not promote austerity measures imf does ask for fiscal consolidation which means imf asks the government to reduce the expenditure but they don't ask to reduce the expenditure on education health or even social welfare what they would ask however is they would ask uh, immediately to uh, you know restructure the subsidies for example what are we going to do with the fuel prices and electricity prices are we going to subsidize everyone for example uh, sri lanka buys fuel for 100 rupees and sell it at 50 so everybody gets fuel at 50 which means the government bears a loss of 50 rupees so should everyone bear that loss or should specific people only get that subsidy it's like you know someone driving a prado why should that person get uh, fuel at the same price that a trisha driver gets right so that's not fair so that's that's where the targeted subsidies comes in this is something that i am strictly advocate for they don't really advocate to cut social spending i think chayu can uh, uh elaborate on this uh, he and i had a separate conversation where he mentioned about uh instances where social spending was encouraged by imf imf during certain programs uh but so i i what i i went through what imf told sri lanka or what uh, Um, what IMF reports contain and what letter of intent to IMF contain in terms of Sri Lanka, in those uh, reports, what they are specifically mentioned is yes, they ask the 
spending cuts. These spending cuts largely have to come from, you know, reduce um, infrastructure, uh, military spending, and also the the emphasis is more on the revenue side. Uh, they are, they ask the government to work on how to increase our revenue rather uh, rather than not more emphasis on cutting expenditure on education or health. So in those reports, what they insist is IMF, we would like to ask Sri Lankan government to promote efforts for fiscal consolidation while keeping investment on education and health. So anyone who is more interested on this can go to IMF website and look at these reports and get rid of these doubts because do not spread this myth saying that, hey, the free education is going to go away because IMF comes, uh, free health is going to go away because IMF comes. It's a lot more uh, different to that. Uh, how, uh, however, about the social welfare scheme, there might be restructuring of uh, social welfare schemes because one thing IMF insists is those who deserve welfare should get it. Not everyone should get it. So, But at the same time, these are not the immediate reforms that IMF would ask for. So these, these reforms, uh, particularly the welfare reforms, you will have a bit of a time to adjust so Sri Lanka can figure it out how to do welfare better. Because whether IMF tells us or not, we need to do our welfare better. Just because someone is from your political party, you shouldn't get some of the, and that's not something that IMF should tell us. It's something that we need to fix. In fact, most of these reforms that people call IMF reforms, these are the reforms that we need to do regardless IMF, right? And if, uh, because we got into our, we got into this mess because we didn't do some of the policy changes, and now that IMF comes and tells us if we, if we brand that as an IMF reform, uh, I think that is also wrong. So, uh, so I don't think, uh, I think this myths and misconception needs to go away, and uh, we should stop making IMF the evil. Yes, IMF has certain ideologies and certain ways. There are things that I disagree with IMF. I, I'm sure Chayu Char, has certain disagreements with IMF. And we all do. Uh, there are a lot of uh, disagreements among economists and among policymakers, uh, the people in the development field. But at this point, what we need is actually to go to that resort, that problem, and you know, uh, do necessary compromises. But uh, that's not going to happen if you keep uh, demonizing IMF, saying that there's not going to be free education, free health. Uh, I would guarantee that there won't be free education or free health cut just because we go to IMF. So we need to get rid of uh, that fear. So I'll stop at that and uh, probably Chah, you can maybe elaborate on the social spending part. Yeah, I mean, that's very true. I think this, especially because you no know, free education, free health care is such a, I think, key component of the Sri Lankan you know, welfare system, something that broadly a lot of us, like not most of us, are very proud of. Uh, and that's even if the IMF asks, so I don't think we should try and even co compromise on that. But I do, but like Unesh said, that's not what the IMF is really uh, saying. I mean, explicitly, I, mean, I just looked up, uh, took up some extractors as well. Uh, you know, to, uh, last year in Zambia's prof uh, profile, they asked for greater investments in healthcare and education. Lebanon, they're talking about increasing uh, social spending. For Ecuador, they had uh, an actual condition to have uh, increased uh, social spending. Argentina as well, asking about increased spending, stop cutting from the people, uh, you know, cut from the, you know, the subsidy side for the rich, you know, increase for the people. Even Sri Lanka's own program, or rather Sri Lanka's Article 4 report, explicitly asked for greater spending, greater, you know, coverage of things. So it is definitely not what the IMF is about. You know, in the past, yes, I think, especially in the 90s, 80s and 90s, the IMF did go on a path, uh, path that was more uh, or rather less protective of wealth. I think that is something that there is some sense of and there is, uh, you know, some level of evidence for that. as well. But, you know, the IMF isn't just one person doing one thing and never change the IMF as the world changes, changes. And it has changed quite a lot over the last uh, decade or so, especially. Uh, and especially over the last few years, especially post-COVID, that change has really accelerated and we really explicitly see that uh, in what the IMF is talking about. So I think it's important to recognize that, yes, perhaps overall welfare, especially if you consider welfare to the rich uh, as part of that, uh, you know, overall indicator, yes, I think that will go down and I think that should go down. And there's no reason why public tax uh, revenue should go to subsidizing the rich. Uh, I think there's broad agreement uh, on that uh, view that I hold. But increasing welfare to those who are poor, those who are in low income groups, I think is something that we need to do, uh, regardless of whether the IMF asks us to do that or not. But you no, know, IMF definitely has space to do that. That's not something the IMF is against. That's something that the IMF has explained explicitly asks for as well. Thank you. Thank you for that, Chayu. 
Um, another question that we keep uh, kind of getting down to kind of backtrack a little bit. Now we've spoken a lot about the IMF as being this one solution that this uh, that we need to kind of um, address. Uh, but another thing that we also mentioned initially was the rising of interest rates. Um, and if you could like explain to uh, audience a little bit about the kind of process that that would uh, entail. How would it help uh, stabilize currency? How would it help kind of curb spending patterns? Of course, there are two sides of it. Uh, there are the benefits and there are the uh, kind of small downfalls. Uh, but if you could elaborate on that, Chayu. Yeah, so I think it's also helpful to recognize that these are policies that we need to do regardless of whether the IMF is with us or not. Um, but it's that the IMF coming on board and supporting us there adds a lot of credibility to these policies and gives a sense that these are not things that this country is just doing and might backtrack on. These are things that you know, there's a broad sense of continuing on it at least for some period of time. So exchange stabilizes or rather exchange rate flexibility something we've thankfully seen, but it has to come along with these other points. I think earlier, uh, Rehana also gave a sense of how that process should have really worked. You know, you need to have interest rate cuts. You need to remove some of these, you know, discrepancies. Why should, uh, you know, banks sell 50% of their dollars to the central bank when they can barely meet a $5 million payment? That doesn't make, make sense to me. You know, there are these little, little things that we need to fix. On the fiscal side, I think, uh, you know, we had a little bit of a discussion on this as well. Uh, it's quite likely that there'll be, you know, an interim budget of sorts, bringing in higher taxes, uh, and also then you know cutting down on expenditure where possible. Uh, you know, I, I saw some questions also on you know how SOE reform is going to come into that. And that's also a thing that's going to be part of this discussion and part of what's possible. It's probably the more politically difficult things SOE reform to really get done, both from the broader political narrative but also more entrenched uh, political situations within the state. Uh, enterprises as well. So, I mean, in terms of a process, you need to start off on the things that we can do immediately and then start on what is, uh, you know, maybe the short to medium term actions, but things that are broadly possible and then at least then move on to the things that are politically dicey uh, and try to get those uh, sorted through as well. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Um, Rena, would you, would you want to say something or? Um, no, I think like Umesh and Chayu pretty much covered all of it. So I, I just think like, you know, we have to, uh, we mustn't forget why we ended up in this situation. Obviously, the things we were doing were not right. That's why we have, you know, had to go to IMF and seek their help. So I, actually, like Chayu and, uh, you know, Umesh said, these are reforms that we have to undertake regardless of whether, you know, IMF is there or not. Um, so you know, like take, for example, increasing um, tax revenue. That's something, you know, we, we, we all know, you know, in the 2019 uh, tax cuts, that's what precipitated this whole crisis. Um, you know, uh, the our deficit, uh, budget deficit increased to record high levels. So obviously, you know that we have to do, you know, we have to increase tax revenue, whether IMF tells us or not, or whether they prescribe that or not, that's something we have to do regardless. Uh, and then on... Um, you know, given that we are in such a prickly situation, obviously the government has to think about, you know, what are the expenses that, you know, do I really need to build this highway this year? Like, you know, I can postpone it, right? I don't need to build it this year. So there are some, um, you know, budgeted expenditures that can be, um, you know, postponed for the future to make, uh, you know, to create the fiscal space that is going to be needed to, you know, for example, to give cash subsidies to poor people uh, when we go into, you know, debt restructuring. So, um, you know, even if we take SOE reforms, I think all of us would agree now that you would rather have, uh, you know, petrol and diesel at market prices than not have any petrol and diesel with, uh, you know, a state, uh, a state-owned enterprise. So I think now people are in a Sort of the, the I, I feel like people are more, you know, if you explain it to them, they are more willing to listen um, and sort of, uh, you know, uh, grasp why we need these reforms. But I, I completely agree with you, Rihanna. I think um, a lot of the issues that we're facing today is a result of these fundamental structural problems that we've been having for the past uh, 70 odd years now. And uh, I think um, at the moment, what we're trying to do is address address the short address the immediate solution but i think it's important for us to also not forget that 
why we uh, come to this position to make sure that it kind of never happens uh, again. Um, and I think another question that we've been getting is, um, so there's more or less a broad sort of consensus, at least amongst ourselves, that we have to go to the IMF. Um, but why has it not happened already? Like you said, in January, there was this, the, the bond payment in January was paid. Um, now this question of this July 1 billion bond, if it's going to be paid or not, do we have the money for it? Do, why are we not going to the IMF? Uh, why are we not restructuring it beforehand? Like what's the hold there? Um, shall I go? I think yes. uh, just like the economy, my background is getting darker and darker and I'll <laughs> go off in a bit like the default. Um, so uh, why the government didn't go to IMF before when it was uh, the feasible solution, particularly when a lot of people specifically asked the government to go to IMF since I think mid-2020, a uh, lot of people, a lot of economists in particular, and even sometimes opposition in this day can be asked to go to IMF that uh, you are unable to make these payments. I think there were quite a few reasons that we can think because we don't know what exactly these reasons are because these, these decisions were taken by the finance minister and then the former central bank governor and the, of course the monetary board. Uh, so for me that they choose to ignore facts and data and uh, you know the evidence um, and then decided against it based on, you know, I don't know what ideologies you call, they call it homegrown, alternative, they came up with various kinds of words um, for these and uh, which didn't make any sense to me. Uh, so I personally felt initially they had a problem with the tax cuts they gave in 2019 end and also the central bank independence uh, legislation. Uh, tax cuts 2019 was a big concern because that was one of the election promises they gave, then they immediately delivered uh, the election promise. This is quite unusual because usually you don't see uh, tax cuts as an election promise, right? I mean, if you go back to the, back to, to uh, looking at... I think, yeah, I think uh, we have, uh... I think, yeah, I think we've lost to Mesh to the power cuts, uh, unfortunately. Um, why don't we just switch the question around to Rehana and Chai, if you have anything to add regarding that. Yeah, I think probably we lost uh, Umesh there, no? Yeah. Um, sorry, what was the question? Uh, just, Nakia, if you could repeat. Yeah, that. sure. Um, it's just, uh, like we were talking about, like, I feel like this entire... There's some sort of broad consensus, at least. Okay, up. like why we didn't go to IMF this long. Yeah, right? I, I mean, I, I think that is, uh, you know, 100% a political, probably a political decision uh, not to go with the IMF. Uh, you know, as, as Umesh said, there, are, there were a lot of proposed, you know, homegrown solutions, uh, import substitution. Uh, you know, we we will we will get uh, you know non debt inflows. Uh, the port city will bring us uh, you know new investors. So I think there was a lot of uh, overconfidence in um, these other policies that the government and the uh, officials had uh, you know uh, come up with. Uh, so they had like I think they had sort of decided to defy uh, orthodox economics thinking and you know go with uh, you know. Uh, presenting, like say in October, they decided to uh, show a six month roadmap. So you can see that, like, when you go back and look at what was done instead of going to the IMF, you can see that I, I think it was mainly a political decision uh, not to, as for like whether you know the rationale or the logic behind it, I, I cannot, you know, I honestly I can't answer that. Um, but yeah, I think it was, I think it's important to appreciate the fact that if we had gone to IMF, let's say one and a half years ago, back when it was actually recommended by so many economists, we would probably, you know, today be in a situation, yeah, yeah, I mean, there would be changes, we would be paying more taxes, things would be, you know, more expensive, and then we'd be, you know, undergoing, uh, you know, state sector reform or whatever. Uh, but we would not be in a situation today where we are, you know, standing, where we are on the streets protesting 
uh, where we are standing for hours in queues to get gas and to get fuel we would not have been in this situation if the decision had been made at the right time i think it's important that people keep that in mind um because you know now we are sort of you know we, we are pretty much hurtling we we have we have gone off the cliff and now we are hurtling downward so you know that's when they decided we go to the imf but we have to appreciate that uh, you know if we had gone at the right time we would not even be in this situation to begin with yeah i i I'll also add something that to me is optimistic and to me this is something that brings me a little bit of hope is that this I, situation where we don't go to the imf and we delay it a lot it's not new to sri lanka uh, a lot of other countries have done the same uh, it's actually so common that there is a, a term for it it's called gambling for redemption where you essentially hope as a government uh, because the imf reforms are painful there's no way around that of course uh, that because that's painful you kind of hope that you can you not know, string things along until something comes and give, brings you redemption so it is something that has happened in many countries before uh and so that that is why that's something that brings me a little bit of hope because i feel like if it's something that's happened for so many countries and it's not that all these countries had then ended up in this absolutely chaotic situation that they didn't recover from some many of these countries actually recovered quite well i think the example of somewhere like thailand or indonesia that you know delayed reforms sometimes even moved back on some things but uh, compared to their late 1990s situation now today in a much much better place so it brings me hope that we will follow the example of these other countries you know maybe through a process of chaos in the short term but you know get out of it uh, eventually and move again on a path of you know in the long term 10 20 years uh, moving ahead you know much much better uh, sri lanka i, I think that's uh, quite likely as well right. thank you thank you for those uh, hopeful words uh, nearing the end of this discussion uh, i think Um, a lot of the fear and frustration that people are having now is because of the seriousness of the situation. And if I could like end this conversation, not like you said, on a little bit of a hopeful note, uh, is there anything that you would like to tell our audience today um, to kind of lift up some spirits and 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 what exactly to remind everybody here today what exactly we are kind of uh, I want to say fighting for essentially. yeah i mean i think in this situation i think now a lot of like everyone's talking about uh, you know everyone's talking about tax cuts and tax revenue and everyone's talking about uh, you know soe reforms this is not something we had maybe 2 years ago so that's that's definitely something positive a lot of people are talking about it a lot of people are understanding um, you know what the issues are so i think it's important that we we keep in mind these lessons that we have learned so next time you know like uh, next time a politician comes and says i'll cut taxes you know you should chase that politician and away and say you know we don't want tax cuts we want you know we want a stable stable economy instead so i think those lessons uh, that uh, the lessons that we have learned over the last 2 years uh, you know uh, are valuable lessons even though it has been you know probably very expensive lessons that we have learned but it is valuable we have you know now it's like a sunk cost we have gone gone through it right so uh, we must you know as um, you know uh, as a generation that has gone through this we should you know learn from it and we should uh, carry it forward and as chayu said you know uh, uh i think one by one these podcasts are getting through all of us and i think it's probably the best uh we kind of wrap things up but yes as rehana was saying uh chai you i was i completely agree that um in times like this even though quite literally and figuratively it looks like we are in the dark i think these lessons are something that we should learn and uh, hopefully not forget um in the coming years um and that being said chai if you have any few last words before we uh decide to end this yeah so i mean again on the on the topic of uh, you know being a little hopeful sorry on the topic of being a little hopeful uh this is a example that i've seen actually now popping up on social media so that's good that these kinds of examples are also coming up uh that of india in their debt crisis uh 1991 19 in the 1990 early 1990s uh at their lowest point they had somewhere like 2 to 3 weeks of uh, imports in their reserves which is not too far away from where we are right now right so it's not too uh 
uh, it was pre- a pretty bad place. They had a lot of political chaos as well, a lot of government shifting here and there. Uh, but you know, through that process, some people came in, uh, Dr. Manmohan Singh, uh, new Prime Minister Manmohan Singh Rao. I mean, obviously, you can criticisms of specific things, specific actions of them, but broadly, uh, India recovered from that. And India today, economically, is at a much, much better place. Of course, other problems can come, pop up. That's a completely different story. Uh, but I think economically, there is a path forward. That path will start with some more pain. Uh, that's not something we can ignore, you know, but I think that path forward will uh, be one of our ways of Sri Lanka as well. Right. Sorry, I, I think I fell off. Not sure what happened. <laughs> Please continue, Rihanna. Yeah, I mean, as I was saying, I think we should remember the lessons that we learned over the last, uh, you know, two years, even though they were very expensive lessons, but we should have hope uh, you know, now we are in a in a situation where actually we are we can uh, you know the appetite for reforms. I I feel like there is a better appetite for reforms now. So all of those things we can you know I hope we can amplify into you know making Sri Lanka the country that you know we all want to you know live in. Thank you, thank you, Dr. And I think we've got some interesting comments regarding all these uh, us just randomly dropping out of this conversation and coming back. Um, but uh, I just want to say thank you to uh, Rihanna, Umesh and Chayu for this very, very interesting conversation. And I want to say thank you to our audience for all the very intriguing questions. Um, and this AdvoChats Advo is a platform that we want to and we have been uh, doing just to clarify any doubts that anyone might have and to kind of get the messages across um, easily. Uh, so thank you. Thank you, Chayu. Thank you, Rehana. And thank you Finish, for joining us in, in difficult times. Um, and thank you to the audience. And as usual, uh, we will try to upload this specific session on our social media pages and our YouTube pages um, as soon as we can, uh, for those of you who were not able to watch it live. Um, and we are hoping to also have similar discussions in Singular and I Avocata Plus pages. So please do follow that. Um, and until next time.